starts right now. Days after a robbery turned deadly, San Antonio police say they've arrested one man they say was involved. This is Kia Dodson. The 21 year old is facing a capital murder charge in connection to a deadly shooting behind a northwest side warehouse earlier this week. We showed you that surveillance video earlier today. You can see the victim, 25 year old Cesar Garcia, walk out of that warehouse. Dodson and the other suspect approach him. Garcia went up a flight of stairs, and that's when police say Dodson and the other suspect tried to rob him. Garcia tried to fight back and was shot several times. That video also showed this black Hyundai Sonata that police say was the getaway car. If you have any information on that or the suspect, please call the SAPD homicide unit. That number on your screen and on our website, ksat.com. Well, March marks four years, believe it or not, since the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic. This week, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention changed its recommendations for isolation if you have the virus. Doctors here in San Antonio say this decision comes after a serious respiratory virus season. The 19th Avery Everett takes us into this discussion amongst doctors. We have seen high levels for a while. At University Health, there aren't many slow days, especially during the peak season for respiratory viruses. Hopefully we're starting to see things come back down as we move into the spring and then summer. Since the start of the new year, Dr. Jason Bowling says positive cases for people with respiratory viruses peaked. He says now in March, that number is starting to dwindle. But across San Antonio, Concern is still high. And this is the time of year historically where we see higher levels of respiratory virus transmission. So if, um, and Dr. Tarek Patel at Baptist Children's Hospital says high case counts in San Antonio match staggering numbers across the United States. It seems like um, these viruses are competing for each other for um, for spreading in the community. And as one goes up, the other one goes down. This drop in infections comes at the same time the Center for Disease Control and Prevention is releasing its updated guidelines for COVID-19. Now, Americans who test positive no longer need to stay in isolation for five full days. With the expected end of the respiratory virus season starting to near, doctors agree that case counts across the country were high. But when it comes to this new CDC guidance, they say even though some people in San Antonio are starting to feel a fatigue when it comes to getting vaccines and taking necessary safety precautions, it's even more important now. People are still at risk. So still take precautions. Bowling says healthy practices like washing your hands or staying at home when you're sick can start to sound repetitive. I think people should just kind of fold this into their regular practice. But he says with viruses still in full swing, this is necessary for people to stay safe. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. Turning now to a look outside with live cam this Saturday night. The cloud cover has been increasing after we saw some patchy fog this morning. After that dissipated, though, we did see a little bit more of that blue sky this afternoon, helping high temperatures climb into the low 80s here in San Antonio. So spring like temperatures have returned and they are not going anywhere for the most part as we look ahead to the back half of the weekend and even more so into next week. So speaking of which, here's a look at your Sunday. The humidity builds overnight, so I think another round of patchy morning fog is expected for early Sunday morning plans, starting off a little bit more on the muggy side near 60 degrees here in town, then high temperatures still climb into the upper 70s, even though we are expecting a little bit more cloud cover out there. We are also looking at another round of some patchy morning fog into Monday before a few isolated rain chances look to make their return into the forecast as early as late Monday afternoon and into the evening. So we're going to talk all about that, plus get you a look at the upcoming week coming up in just a few. Thank you, Mia. And with the return of the warm weather comes the need for more firefighters at active scenes. Everyone made it out alive at this house fire on Arrow Way on the northeast side, but more than 15 units had to respond to the fire so crews could rotate and take breaks because of how warm it was this afternoon. Warm temps, strong winds and low humidity in the panhandle are making it increasingly difficult for crews to put out what is now the largest wildfire in Texas history. The Smokehouse Creek fire has charred 1700 square miles of land. Two people have died and hundreds of structures have been destroyed since the wildfire broke out on Monday. Right now, the fire is about only 15 percent contained and has even crossed state lines into Oklahoma. It's also important to note this is not the only active fire in the panhandle. According to the Texas A&M Forest Service, crews are dealing with four other fires nearby. 
Following the destruction of the fires in the Panhandle, HEB and its chairman, Charles Butt, are donating $1 million total to help firefighters battling those blazes on the front line. $500,000 will go to the Texas Agricultural Relief Fund. The other half will fund recovery efforts and other nonprofits responding to that wildfire. Well, despite all of this damage, San Antonio police say everyone involved in this crash walked away with just minor injuries. It happened this afternoon on the south side near Pleasanton and Hutchins. As the night team's Daniela Ibarra explains, police believe this all unfolded because of road rage. The damage is horrific. Airbags deployed and personal belongings scattered in the street. I see like small accidents, but not something like this. This is huge. He says there's always traffic near Pleasanton and Hutchins. All day long, it's just cars, 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 cars. Yes, it is busy. Rocco was working in a shop when the crash happened. He says it was so loud, he stopped what he was doing to check it out. I was just doing brakes and oh my God, just like a big old noise, like an explosion and kind of like somebody screamed. San Antonio police say they were trying to catch the driver of this truck. One woman says she saw patrol cars rush down her street. We live nearby and uh, we just heard this commotion. Police say a woman called 911, accusing the driver of pulling a gun on her. Moments later, that driver led officers on a chase before crashing. The other two cars at the scene just happened to be in the area. And that's scary. Everybody needs to drive and be careful and have more patience and be safe. An apparent case of road rage weighing on these drivers. It makes me more nervous coming down the street. I think it, the main problem, it's people's heart. That's what needs to be changed. Despite the damage, police expect everyone involved to be okay. As for the suspect, he was taken to the hospital to get checked out. Daniela Ibarra, KSAT 12 News. To the campaign trail now, former President Donald Trump inching closer to that Republican nomination. Trump wrapped up victories in the Idaho and Missouri caucuses today and took home all the delegates in the Michigan Republican Party convention. Meanwhile, his last remaining Republican rival, Nikki Haley, is still yet to get a win this election season. The focus now turns to Washington, D.C., where Republicans there will vote in a primary tomorrow ahead of the Super Tuesday elections next week. There were no Democratic contests today. And just a few primary election reminders. Early voting has now ended and the polls will reopen in just a few days on Tuesday, March 5th, Election Day and Super Tuesday. We have information on voting locations and a sample ballot. You can look at right now on our website, ksat.com. Also happening on Super Tuesday, KSAT will have complete coverage of elections and some early results for races here in San Antonio and the surrounding area. Join Myra, Myra Arthur and Steve Spreester for the KSAT Super Tuesday live stream Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Coverage will be available on all of our streaming platforms. Still ahead on the night beat, a mistake in a written report ended the career of former Bear County Deputy Michael Fernandez and left him labeled a convicted criminal. Why that deputy told KSAT explains the sheriff's office abandoned him when he needed them most. Plus, the word narcissist is a popular term these days, but have you ever stopped to think about what it actually means? Hear what a licensed counselor says about the word and why it might do more harm than good. And the next generation of military service members are growing up right here in San Antonio, how they're getting help to achieve their dreams and what's inspiring them along the way. But first, on this day, 188 years ago, Texas broke away from Mexico and became the independent Republic of Texas. Dignitaries like Sam Houston and Lorenzo de Zavala were just a few names signed on that document that officially declared Texas its own country. So before we head to break, we want to wish everyone a very happy Texas Independence Day. The next generation of military service members live right here in San Antonio. Young men and women still in high school got a chance to learn more about attending military academies at the U.S. Military Service Academy Day at Holmes High School. Students found out how the academies work, what makes each one different, and how to best prepare for the application process. 
Kieran Luke is a junior in high school and was there to learn more. He found an academy he's interested in, but his desire to join the armed forces is not a new interest. Kieran says he has tons of family members who served or are still serving in the military. We asked him what it means to have those family members to look up to and if they're influencing his decision to join the military. To be honest, to me, that's amazing. And it influences my choice because I just want to be like them. They inspire me every day. So sweet. Well, this is the sixth time Congressman Joaquin Castro has hosted this event for San Antonio students. A dangerous winter storm is beating down on Northern California with rare blizzard conditions and fierce winds as it threatens to unload up to 10 feet of snow in the mountains and snarl travel. In Sierra Nevada, the storm is delivering heavy snow, reduced visibilities, toppled power lines, and hurricane force winds over 75 miles per hour, which are expected to roar through the rest of the weekend. Amber Worthy reports millions in the region are under winter weather alerts and tens of thousands are already without power. March's weather is roaring in like a lion in the Mountain West. Dangerous weather is slamming parts of California and Nevada with rare blizzard conditions. Hurricane force winds are causing blinding conditions and icy roads shut down a stretch of I-80 at the California-Nevada border. One of the things that, that has us concerned is that we're going to see the storm, the snowfall preceded by the rain. Uh, the snow is going to hit the ground and it has the ability as the temperatures drop over the nights, um, it's going to freeze. About half a million people are under blizzard warnings in the Mountain West, with another six million under winter weather alerts across the region. Officials are urging people to stay indoors, and residents say they are prepared. Made sure we had eggs and stuff, because you need to plan ahead and not wait for the last minute. One upside of the storm will be its effect on California's water supply. A survey conducted by California's Department of Water Resources before the storm found snowpack in some areas is already at 80% of the March average. Back on January 1st, we were about three inches of snow water content. On February 1st, 10 inches of snow water content, and now we're at 18. <clears throat> so we have built really nicely. Millions of people in the West depend on a melting snowpack in warmer months for hydropower, irrigation, and drinking water, according to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. I'm Amber Worthy reporting. Well, that's definitely not what San Antonio looks like. We had we had a little white going on this morning. <laughs> it wasn't snow. In the form of fog. fog. It was very foggy. Yes, I yeah. walked out this morning <laughs> to let the dogs out and just kind of just peeking around. A lot of people <laughs> driving with the low yes. beams on, going slow. Good. Yeah, we had some some dense fog at times yeah. to kickstart this Saturday. Take a look at this photo actually sent in wow. to KSAT Connect. This is from the Floresville and Poth area. You can just see how dense it was. Kind of hard to make out some of those trees out there uh, in the horizon. But I bring this up because I think into tomorrow morning, some areas are going to look like that again. And I want to go ahead and show you why. So we've been talking about the increase in humidity that we've been seeing throughout the evening, and that's going to continue through the overnight. So dew points about 10 to even 20 degrees higher right now compared to where they were this time last night, which essentially just means you're going to start to notice a little bit more of a muggy feel when you step outdoors and that carries over into your Sunday and even more so into Monday before we start to see a slight break in that humidity in the Tuesday to Wednesday time frame looking ahead to next week. So with that moisture pumping back into the region, you can see here in your future cast through the overnight hours by about three to four o'clock in the morning. We are expecting some of those visibilities to drop thanks to that patchy fog that will continue into morning drive time. If you have any Sunday morning activities to step out to probably a good idea to give yourself a little bit of extra time just to get to where you need to be safely before that dissipates by mid to late morning. Now, temperature wise, we mentioned that more humid feel that translates over to our morning low temperatures as well. For context, this morning we started off in the upper 40s here in town, upper 50s, low 60s. That's it. That's all we're expecting to drop down to by the time the sun comes up tomorrow because of that fog increasing as well as the cloud cover. By the way, speaking of the cloud cover, I do think we will see more of 
bit into your Sunday afternoon compared to a little bit more of that blue sky and sunshine that we saw earlier this afternoon. Despite that, though, temperatures are still expected to warm unseasonably warm into the afternoon tomorrow near 70 degrees at noon. High temperatures topping off in the upper 70s for a good chunk of the area, I think especially along and south of the Highway 90 corridor, especially for places like Poteet, Pleasanton, Floresville, even Nixon. We could see those thermometers climb into the low 80s by tomorrow afternoon as well. Our average high is in the low 70s for this time of year, so about 10 degrees warmer than that for the end of the weekend plans. Looking ahead, though, to the start of the upcoming work week, you can see those afternoon highs still very spring like upper 70s and 80s are expected. I do think we will see another round of patchy morning fog and even some drizzle come Monday morning, but then notice by late afternoon and into the evening, we actually have a chance to find a few isolated downpours, maybe a stray thunderstorm or two. So let's talk about that setup. No rain out there right now, but we do have the cloud cover that's been streaming in from the west this Saturday night. That storm that we were also talking about a little bit earlier that's dumping snow across portions of the west coast and even into the Pacific Northwest. That's associated with that area of low pressure where temperatures are much colder compared to where we are here in San Antonio. There's going to be a little disturbance on the south side of that parent area of low pressure that's going to move into the Lone Star State come Monday. And again, we've got about a 30% potential for a few downpours to an isolated storm possible there. So not going to be a for everybody, but at least it's something and we're not finished with the isolated rain chances. Another one moves in Thursday and then into Friday ahead of our next cold front. That one could clear us out and cool us down a little bit more into next weekend. Courtney, definitely something to look forward to. Okay, thank you, Mia. Mary, we're talking Trinity women's basketball. Yes, they've been a historically fantastic program. And once again, they reach the NCAA tournament, although this time they meet the end of the road in the second round. How it happened coming up. Plus, the UTSA men's basketball team visited SMU as 17 and a half point underdogs and the rest is history. The Roadrunners stunning win in Dallas after the break. If you blinked, you missed it. Texas football's Xavier Worthy, the new holder of the NFL Combine 40-yard dash record with that run you just saw. We'll hear from the fastest man in NFL Combine history in big board sports. But first, late season college hoops for the UTSA women as they visit Wichita State first quarter. A transition bucket for Roadrunner senior Jordan Jenkins. Second quarter, UTSA up 10, Asia Proctor with a catch and shoot. And the Clemens alum drains the three. The Roadrunners led 34-21 at the half. Third quarter, UTSA sophomore Sienna Goddaro knocks down the corner triple. And the Roadrunners take this one 68-61, securing their first ever winning, excuse me, first winning regular season since 2014. The squad hosts Rice for their regular season finale on Tuesday. The UTSA men's basketball team battling SMU and Moody Coliseum. The Roadrunners are underdogs in this one, and they love it. UTSA trailed most of the first half until an 11-0 run to tie the game, and Jordan Ivy Curry nails the long jumper for the lead. Six minutes into the second half, Tic-tac-toe to Trey Emmons for the slam dunk. What a battle this is late in the game. It's Ivy Curry from downtown. He had 33 points, followed by 23 from P.J. Carter as UTSA wins at 77 to 73, leaving SMU stunned. Their home finale is next Sunday versus Temple. Second round of the NCAA Division III Women's Basketball Tournament, Trinity squaring off against 10th ranked Harden Simmons in Abilene. The Tigers beat Mary Harden Baylor yesterday to advance. First quarter, Trinity junior Josie Napoli jumbles up the defense and kicks it out to a wide open Kylie Minter for the corner three. Later, it's Napoli again. She Euro steps around two defenders for the hoop and harm so impressive although Harden Simmons gets hot 
up 30 to 18 late in the first half and Sky O'Rourke extends the lead with the triple from the corner. Trinity had a tough hill to climb coming out of halftime and in the end the Tigers fall 84 to 62. Their season ends 23 and 6 overall. You saw it right off the jump. Here it is again. Former Texas wide receiver Xavier Worthy blazes through the premier event at the NFL Combine with an official time of 4.41 in the 40 yard dash, besting John Ross's all time record from 2017 by 0 0.01 seconds. Worthy reached 24.21 miles per hour, according to Next Gen Stats. Here's Worthy after the exceptional run out of breath and all. I watched it come out my whole life as a kid. Since John Ross won that, man, I never thought I'd be able to be on the stage and do that. They told me just be patient. You'll peak at the right time. Time's now, so it's all came at the right time. This afternoon at Bob Benson 66 Stadium, the Central Catholic boys soccer team taking on Houston St. Thomas Catholic in the TAPS Division I Regional Finals. In the first minute, off the feed, St. Thomas's Mambo Tello strikes and finds the bottom right corner to get scoring going early. The buttons answer back with a relentless barrage first. J.J. Birch's shot is blocked, but Evan Pacheco goes opposite corner and finds paradise. This one stayed a close game, but in the end, the Buttons win 3-2 to two to advance to the state semifinals. It's buzzer beater season, and there's been too many to count. Last night in the class, 3A regional semifinals, the Cole boys basketball team sent Corpus Christi London packing with this insane buzzer beater by Ajan Hasidin Ratana to win the game 51 to 50. Today, Cole defeated Post 46 to 43 in the regional final. So the regional champion Cole Cougars are state bound. After a buzzer beater of their own last night, the O'Connor boys basketball team's quest for a state title in 6A cut short in the regional final against Stony Point 65 to 42 the final. In 5A, Veterans Memorial is on to the state tournament next week in the Alamo Dome after defeating Edinburgh Vela 66 to 53. All right, coming up later in the show, we're talking Spurs basketball. So many close. This season's crazy. It has been. It's a great really? postseason. Yeah. Yeah, it's been an exciting one, I know, for you guys. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mary. We'll be right back. A mistake in a written report not only ended Michael Fernandez's law enforcement career, it left him labeled a convicted criminal. The former Bear County Sheriff's deputy is breaking his silence about the toll that label has taken on his life. Telling KSAT Investigates Dylan Collier, BCSO abandoned him when he needed the agency the most. When we first met Michael Fernandez in December 2017, he didn't seem all that concerned with his legal predicament. Man, this is all frivolous stuff. The detention officer, Michael Fernandez, camera operator, who was assigned to the sheriff's special emergency response team, had been accused a year and a half earlier of assaulting an inmate who was about to be released. Portions of the June 2016 incident were captured on jail surveillance cameras. The inmate, Gilbert Ramos, had this pointed message for Fernandez after officers detained him. That was stupid move, man. I'm gonna file charges on you, you know that, right? Yeah, stupid move. Records show Ramos did file a formal complaint, claiming that Fernandez threw him to the ground while Ramos was seated. So you grabbed his legs? Weeks after the incident, a fellow deputy told sheriff's investigators he saw Ramos scuffling with Fernandez. Was the inmate complying? No, he was not complying. He was uh, very resistive. I, I was just always kind of trained to act quick. Uh, don't wait. Uh, if something's in your, in your gut, um, act. But Fernandez's official statement on the altercation included the claim that Ramos was standing when Fernandez grabbed him. After video disputed that assertion, Fernandez amended his report writing that the inmate was in fact seated when he made physical contact with him. But the damage was done. Although Fernandez was demoted from CERT, he continued to work for BCSO after the incident and says he even completed his peace officer's training course in hopes of moving to a patrol position. 
Instead, a Bear County grand jury in late 2017 indicted him on four charges, official oppression, violating the civil rights of a person in custody, assault, and tampering with a government record. Did you have any idea that it had even been forwarded to the DA's office for investigation? Not at all. A jury in March 2019 found Fernandez not guilty on the first three counts of the indictment, but convicted him on a misdemeanor tampering charge. Fernandez, who was sentenced to six months probation and no jail time, says Sheriff Javier Salazar turned his back on a deputy who made a simple error on a report and had corrected it within weeks. Let's just say I saw the video. I saw it. It's, there it is. And then I go and write that. That's tampering the government record. I feel like the sheriff's like the Pope. He's untouchable. If he were to commit a crime, like how, who, who, who watches him? Fernandez, who says he spent $36,000 on legal fees from his original trial and attempts to get the conviction overturned, claims the stigma of having a record hasn't faded with time. I worked really hard to 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 get to that position, and um, it just went all away. It has took a toll on my um, on my mental health. For Case That Investigates, I'm Dylan Collier. Fernandez's latest appeal, a writ of habeas corpus, was denied by his trial court last summer. BCSO officials declined to make Sheriff Javier Salazar available for an interview and referred our questions about his trial to the district attorney's office. Still ahead on the night beat, the word narcissism is thrown out a lot these days, but do you know the real meaning? Why using it could do more harm than good? Next on the night beat. Scroll through social media or talk to your friends, chances are you'll probably come across the term narcissist. It's a trendy word right now. It's actually one of the most Google terms on the internet, but mental health experts want you to hold off on using it so often to describe people. One therapist tells our Stefania Jimenez why throwing the label narcissist around so easily is harmful. So narcissism, when, I, when you hear that word, you see that word, what comes to mind? They're controlling, they don't allow you to be an individual or think for yourself. I, I think of someone basically that's super into themselves, like uncaring, unfeeling, um, just doesn't really have empathy. Nicole DePillo and Stephanie Bauer are right. Those can be narcissistic traits, but there's more to narcissistic personality disorder. For starters, NPD is a mental health condition and a pervasive pattern of behaviors that impacts all areas of life. Only psychologists and psychiatrists can diagnose it. The research says that most of us do have narcissistic traits, but it's unclear how common narcissistic personality disorder actually is. Researchers from the Cleveland Clinic say that up to 5% of people in the U.S. have it. The American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual says symptoms for NPD include a grandiose sense of self-importance, a belief in superiority, and entitlement. That's a big thing. Uh, uh, the irritability. Uh, thin-skinned. They do not like to be told no. Tracy Hurt is a licensed professional counselor. She works with survivors of narcissistic abuse. Their uh, stability, their mental stability is questioned. The reality of where they're living at uh, and what they've gone through as uh, the periods of uh, invalidation for them. Uh, they could be scared. Um, they could be uh, confused. That's why Tracy urges people who think they are or have been in a relationship with a narcissist to get help. But she also cautions people against labeling others as narcissists without a proper diagnosis. For those who actually have MPD, uh, that creates uh, a sense of rejection uh, for them and also mar marginaliz marginalization. Uh, for them. And the other thing, it increases the stigma. A stigma, Tracy says, could keep individuals with NPD from getting the help they need. So when people are describing, maybe uh, describing somebody who maybe they think has those traits, maybe they could just call out that behavior? They or, could call out that behavior or they can call it antagonistic uh -huh. or disagreeable mm -hmm. uh, traits rather than using the clinical term. Uh, that uh, licensed professionals should use. Stefania Jimenez, KSAT 12 News. 
There is no cure for narcissistic personality disorder, but there is treatment. Experts recommend people with NPD get therapy and possibly medication if they have other mental health conditions like depression. All right, let's head back outside with live cam temperatures in the mid 60s right now here in San Antonio. And honestly, with the increasing cloud cover and the fog developing overnight, they are not expected to fall too terribly much more from what we are seeing out there right now. It was a different story, though, this morning. It was chilly out there. We did manage to dip down into the upper 40s to kickstart the day near the average low for this time of year. But check this out, 10 degrees above the average high this afternoon after we saw some more of that sunshine return high of 81 the records 93 and 19 set back in 1909 and 1980 pretty much all of us climbing into the 80s gonzalez beville the exception only in the mid to upper 70s out there 84 in hondo is 87 out west in del rio and 86 in carrizo springs earlier this afternoon now as we look ahead to the back half of the weekend and even into the upcoming week the first full week of march you can see spring-like temperatures temperatures continue still warmer than average in the upper 70s and even some 80s out there as well. We also do have some isolated rain chances, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Plus, get you a recap how February ended for us here in the Alamo City after the break. So it's been an interesting year so far with the rainfall. I mean, <laughs> we didn't have it, and then we had a lot of it. So that's kind exactly, of break that down. That's exactly right. We had a lot of soaking rain right. at the end of January, and even February started off pretty good too. It but did. then after that, we dried out, and then the temperatures got a little warmer, and then got a little <laughs> colder. We saw a little bit. We've of We've been all over the place. We certainly have. So speaking <laughs> of which, let's get you a look at how February ended, in case you missed it here in San Antonio. So officially here in town. Over eight tenths of an inch, just under nine. We actually were the same amount below the average for the month. So we did in drier than average, climatologically speaking, in San Antonio. The hottest high temperature that we saw, 87 degrees on February 22nd. The coldest low temperature is when we briefly touched a light freeze. 32 degrees the morning of February 18th. Overall, though, we were almost four degrees warmer than average. Now, as we look ahead to March, yesterday the average high was 70, average low 48. But by the end of the month, we warm average high 77, average low 55. So that just goes to show that, yes, we will start to see these temperatures on average start to warm a little bit more so as well. And of course, spring begins on March 19th with the spring equinox. And it's gonna be feeling like spring over the next several afternoons. Highs still in the upper 70s and low 80s, maybe even mid 80s by Tuesday. We are expecting the humidity to build even more so overnight, leading to some areas of patchy fog tomorrow morning and into Monday as well. And then we have a few more notable rain chances, pretty isolated, so it's not going to be for everybody, but something we are going to continue to monitor here in the days ahead. So I mentioned that fog that is expected to develop, some of which could be dense in spots by the time you're stepping out for any Sunday morning plans. Right now, no issues when it comes to visibility, but just know first thing tomorrow morning, we could have some reduced visibility like what we saw earlier today. So just something to keep in mind. Temperatures starting off more humid near 60 degrees, mostly cloudy skies in store throughout the majority of the day. But temperatures are still expected to warm pretty efficiently. So 66 degrees at 11 a.m., 74 at 2 o'clock. High temperatures in the upper 70s for many of us, right around 77 degrees officially here in town. And here's another way to look at that. By 7 a.m. tomorrow, again, we've got the cloud cover building in, the patchy fog there too. And even into the afternoon, still mostly cloudy. So a little bit of a difference from what we saw earlier today. And then into Monday morning, yes, the cloud cover sticks around. Yes, another round of patchy fog is expected, but I think as we throw even more moisture into the region, some areas of patchy drizzle will be possible for the Monday morning drive. Maybe enough to get those windshield wipers going. 20% chance for a few isolated showers into Monday afternoon, and then by the evening and into Monday night, we've got a 30% potential for a few downpours to a stray rumble of thunder. So something to definitely check back in on over the next 48 hours. We are 
dry into Tuesday and for the most part into Wednesday as well. We'll see a slight break in some of the humidity, but then even more moisture works in Thursday and into Friday, and that could help spark a few more showers and storms before we head into next weekend. So here's what the upper level setup looks like with that. There's that disturbance that's going to move in just a few downpours possible into Monday evening that works east. Dry, we are drying to Tuesday and Wednesday, and then here comes a second area of low pressure into the early morning hours of our Friday that looks to drop our next cold front into the region, and that is what could help spark that 30% potential for a few more showers and storms Thursday and into Friday morning. After that, cooling down potentially lower humidity moving in into next weekend. It is trending drier. I know it's the start of spring break for a lot of folks in as well. So again, keep checking in on that. We will continue to keep you posted as we get closer. Do want to end with this keeping this on your radar 37 days until the total solar eclipse on Monday, April 8th. Your eclipse fact in the US totality will begin at 1 27 PM in Texas and end in Maine at 3 35 so cool that we're part of that. I'm so excited. I still can't believe yep. it. Yep. Okay, thanks, Mia. All right, Mary. I mean, it's in the bag for Wemby. He knows that, right? I think many people agree with you, Courtney. <laughs> yes, if Victor Wembanyama's output in February didn't convince you he should be Rookie of the Year, his March performance will likely do the trick. I don't know. We'll hear what Wemby thinks about the award coming up. Plus, it's the end of an era in Dallas. Tyron Smith is expected to hit free agency. Details coming up. Spurs prized French big man Victor Wembanyama is on track to finish his rookie year with one of the best stat lines in NBA history, averaging 20 points, 10 rebounds, 3 assists, and 3 blocks. With a month and a half left in the regular season, Wembanyama is the clear favorite to win the Rookie of the Year award. And many agree the Rookie of the Year race between Wembanyama and OKC's Chet Holmgren is over after the spectacular month of February Wemby had, accumulating first of its kind numbers with over 50 assists, 45 plus blocks, 25 plus threes made, and more than 20 steals. Individual success means team success for Wemby. It's uh, very important for me because it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that, I mean, I, I, you know, I am who I am. I'm, uh, I'm in the, the organization, you know, that trusts me. I'm, I'm convinced that uh, the best way for me to help my team is by being uh, also individually performing and uh, you know on a, on a whole season so it's a uh, so yes individual awards like rookie of the year are very important for me I feel like it's been over but um, I mean night in night out the stuff that he does um, the impact that he has on both ends of the floor um, big shot after big block after whatever the case may be I mean he's he doesn't even act like a rookie I mean the shots that he shoots the confidence that he has in his game is second to none yeah, Wemby's developing at a rapid pace. All right, next up for San Antonio, a 6 o'clock tip-off against Indiana tomorrow at Frost Bank Center. The Pacers coming off of a tough 27-point loss to the Pelicans, so they'll be hungry for a bounce back. One of the Dallas Cowboys' longest tenured players, All-Pro and Pro Bowl left tackle Tyron Smith, is expected to be a free agent, according to NFL Network's Ian Rappaport. The 33-year-old has spent his entire career in a Dallas uniform and has been a significant piece to the Cowboys' offensive line over the last 13 seasons. So we should expect to see Jerry Jones and the Dallas Cowboys in the market for a new blindside protector this offseason. We'll be right back after the break. Here's one final look at your Sunday forecast against some patchy fog greeting you out the door for early morning plans. A muggy start near 60, high temperature near 77, mostly cloudy skies, wind out of the south southeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour. That is what's allowing more of that Gulf moisture to work in. So another round of fog expected early Monday. A few isolated downpours to a storm possible Monday evening, warming things up Tuesday and Wednesday. Then another round of some isolated rain ahead of a cold front next Friday. All right, our viewers, if you tuned in this weekend and last weekend, we've been on time for all of our sports games, so you have to watch every single weekend, especially on Saturdays. Thanks for being with us. We'll